Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Songwriters on Process podcast. My name is Benno Papari, and since 2010, I've run the Songwriters on Process website, where you can find more than 200 conversations with songwriters about the creative process. I'm not here to talk about tour stories, band drama, how a band got its name, or favorite foods. My goal is to treat songwriters as writers, plain and simple. This is an intelligent conversation about the writing process between two writers. And this week's interview is with Will Chef of Ockerville River. Uh, Chef has a new solo album out called Nothing Special. Uh, It comes out October 7th. Uh, Fun fact about Chef is that he was an English major at McAllister College in Minnesota. And so when I found that out, of course, I wanted to talk to him about literature and who his favorite writers are. And he's a big fan of the classics. Those writers you'd find in a... In any English or American lit survey course, he mentions Whitman, Blake, Chaucer, Emily Dickinson, and how how um, they had a big influence on on him uh, as a writer growing up, and just on him in general. A lot of the things they talk about, those writers discuss in their writing, spoke to him as well growing up, and I think that they still influence the songwriting today. They've always had a big impact on him. One of the things that um, certainly he has in common with them is, uh, the importance of writing, doing something every day. I mentioned this before, but, uh, a lot of songwriters, well, I should say novelists will tell you, poets, playwrights will tell you that you've got to write every day. Songwriters don't tell me that as often, but chef's a firm believer in creating every day. Uh, his routine is pretty simple. He gets up or he wakes up. Uh, rolls over, gets his phone, and starts to write. Doesn't check social media. He writes. First thing he does in the morning is he starts to write, and he recommends that for everyone. He tries to do something every day. And his words are, he likes to make a date with songwriting. Um, He says, you've just got to show up and do it. And he's also, another thing, he's also a big organizer. He says that some people like to crochet. I like to organize. Uh, he said, "If he started his life, his, if he started his life over again, he'd probably be a librarian or an archivist because he's very soothed by putting things in order." And I've had other songwriters tell me that as well about how they like to be organized or make organization a part of their process. But I think I mentioned that in reference to his the voice memos on his phone. But he's big on organization and how that makes him feel good. Lastly, um, you know, just as a few minutes ago, I talked to you, I told you that he he talked about the importance of writing every day. Um, But then he said that it's important to loaf. I think that's actually a Whitman quote. It's important to loaf and give yourself that open state of mind to be open to creativity. And to that end, you know, loafing is about being creative in times when you're not doing much. And so he gets a lot of song ideas, creative ideas while he's walking the dog. Um, And so that's what we mean about about loafing, being open, not necessarily forcing creativity, but being open to, to loaf, to loafing. So uh, this was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed talking to him. This was a deeply intellectual discussion. So just be aware of that. There's some deep stuff we talked about with creativity and words and writing. Um, and I want to mention this also, that if you have not checked out Chef's interview where he interviews Roki Erickson, please do that. It's online. I'm a big, big Erickson fan, and and Chef interviewed him a few years ago. And uh, check that out as well. So anyway, with that, here is my interview with Will Chef of Ockerville River. Outside of songwriting... Um, do you do any other types of writing? Do you journal? Is there any type of writing that you do? You know, some songwriters tell me they just strictly write songs, nothing else. But how about you? Where do you fall in that category? No, no. I mean, I actually started out, you know, I was one of these kids who had a hard time finding my place in the world. I was, grew up in a really small town and it was, it was all the boys my age were like getting into hunting and athletics. And I was like, had a lot of um, a lot of like uh, things that held me back physically, you know, like really bad. I, I kind of had an illness when I was younger that screwed up my coordination, and I had really bad asthma, and I had undiagnosed like messed up eyesight. So it wasn't until much later in my life that I realized that I I was only seeing things at about a quarter of what 
<laughs> I was supposed to be. So I just like had really poor orientation in the physical world. So I really threw myself into like, you know, I wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to make special effects for movies, for, for science fiction and f- fantasy and horror movies. I wanted to be an author. I wanted to be a singer. You know, I, w- I wanted to be a painter. Um, that was like my whole, you know, elementary school experience. And that translated on into high school. And, you know, one of the things I learned was that even though I had really shitty grades, um, I was really, really good at all the writing portions of everything. I'd always get really, really high SAT scores. And it was like, I would get A's in like English classes and then like F's and D's in math classes and science classes. And it was like the one thing, you know, in a culture, sort of a small town culture where I was getting like bullied and ragged on all the time. It was like one of the only things I knew I was like, not only good at, but like better at than anybody else in my class. So I got into, I got into writing and, and I've always written. Um, and you know, I, in, in college I wrote, was writing a novel. Then I, I kind of had a weird thing happen to me in college where my senior project, which was a novel, it got like really poorly mishandled by the academic structure somebody just like forgot to file some paperwork and I ended up like kind of like not getting, knowing that I wasn't going to get any credit for it. Like when I was like two thirds of the way through. And then I had a teacher who, this is going to sound really firebrandy and I don't mean for it to, but like he kind of was criticizing it for being, he, he, I don't want to get too into it. He gave me a lot of criticism that was like the exact kryptonite for my confidence at that moment. Hmm. And he put me off writing for about 15 years. Um, and I just found that like, I guess songwriting was felt like it was like, um, songwriting was like the opposite of what all my English classes were about. In my all my English classes, like I just didn't feel like I fit in all my creative writing classes and 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 the, the writers that were in vogue at the time and the way that people were talking about writing, like just really, really turned me off. And I think that's what made me want to become a songwriter. But but I think I'd always um been attracted to figures like, you know, um William Blake was like, you know, I I didn't know this. Um for a while but like william blake he sang those those songs of innocence songs of experience those aren't just metaphors like he had melodies for them and would perform them for people that they come over to his house um and he was known more in his life as a printmaker anyway so i think i i really attached myself to these figures like william blake and like i was really strongly connected with like folk traditions so like robert burns and like even like Sappho was like a singer songwriter, you know, like yeah. she performed on a lyre and she played shows. So I think that for me, uh, around the time that I felt like this real square peg in my creative writing programs was when I started to see this like beauty of song as a, um, as a style of writing that was like, I felt like I was the only one that was seeing that it was really like noble you know what I mean? Yeah. And at the same time, I felt like at my school, it was regarded as like, um, it just, it was, so, it was pretty, it was a pretentious vibe in the writing program. That, and so <laughs> songwriting and rock and roll is like really unpretentious. And so I think that was what drove me into the arms of rock and roll sort of, so to speak. Uh, you, you know, a couple of comments. One is I had a different experience from you. I was not really a confident writer in high school at all. And um, I'm not sure that I tried that hard, but I just had no confidence. And I was never given any enough positive feedback to realize that I was a good writer. And then um, my freshman year in college, my first paper, I got an A on. Now, this was 
I still have this is I I started college in 1987. I still have this paper. It's on a dot mm. matrix printer, and I still have <laughs> I still have the paper. I still have the grade because it was an A. And my teacher said things to me that no one ever said before in those comments. Yeah. And I still have that's almost 40 years old, and I still have that paper. I still I have, have it, and I go back to it. And and I remember that as a moment where I thought, wow, maybe. And I wrote as an A writer. From that moment on, am I, did I become a better writer over the summer? Hell no. There was no difference between high school and, and college in that summer. But it was the confidence. It was when she yeah. told me those things on that paper. And I'll never forget that. Like I, That was such a big moment for me because ever as soon as she said that, I thought, wow, maybe I am better than I think I am and that other people think I am too. And then I became an English major. I never had any plans to be an English major in college. Um, it really is that magic feather thing. You know what I mean? And yeah. it, where it's sort of like somebody tells you this thing and God, I was, that was the one way that I was really lucky is that I had that from a very early age. It was like the only thing I knew I was good at. But then of course, because in high school, I was like devouring like James <laughs> Joyce and P.S. <laughs> Eliot and, you know, Dylan Thomas and stuff. I came into college with like a head full of steam, like and a <laughs> and a big packed folder of like extremely purple prose. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I was giving people this Finnegan's Wake type stuff, and they were just like, I mean, what? <laughs> way sub like like a, a teenager trying to write Finnegan's Wake. So as as excruciating as you can imagine that would be, and they were like, slow your roll, buddy. You know, right. <laughs> And I couldn't, I, I, I guess maybe I couldn't take criticism at the one thing I'd never been criticized at. You know what I mean? Like I was yeah. like, I know, I know I suck in every way, but writing, now you're telling me that like this is writing isn't connecting. So maybe that threw me into a little bit of a tailspin. I don't that know. Is, yeah. And you know, the other thing when I was in graduate school, I still have, I still have this paper too, is I think my first year for my PhD program. And you know, you're still used to as an undergraduate writing papers where you feel like you have to tell your professors what everyone else is saying rather than forming your own opinions. And I, I remember I, my, one of my, in my first year for my PhD program, my professor wrote on my, on one of the papers, when am I going to get you to grapple? And mm. And, and uh, wow, like that stuff of all the comments, I remember seeing that it was like the light and I thought, wow, I need to be grappling with the writing. I need to be grappling with one. And I love that verb to grapple. Um, yeah. And it was so powerful and it made me engage with the reading um, more than I ever had before. I said this to someone yesterday that I think I could probably count on one hand the number of songwriters in the 300 I've interviewed who tell me that they read poetry, uh, which is deeply distressing to me um, because I feel like it, I know that this is not a discussion of whether songwriting is poetry, but still poets deal with with, you know, how words sound with the economy of language. And I think that there is value to that. But did reading those poets, the T.S. Eliot's, the Dylan Thomas's, how did uh, other takeaways from there, maybe consciously that you think about, you know, in your songwriting as well? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I think that I um, saw those things as connected. I mean, I don't know. It's impossible in the midst of time to like, unravel exactly how this all came about with people but the thing that i often say is like people think of songwriting as like not writing but you could probably make an argument that songwriting might be the first art that anybody ever engaged in because you don't need any tools to do it you just need to like and and animals do it you know what i mean yeah. like singing singing is I maybe you could say is the first art that, that anybody engaged in. And then from singing to songwriting is a really small step. And I always thought of um, poetry as a sort of a rarefication and refinement in that European way of songwriting, you know, like where it's sort of like, let's take, let's sort of abstract it out into this kind of like fancy refined form. But yeah, I mean, I think that for whatever reason, I I did maybe make the connection that they were related. Um, when I first started to release my own music and, and I was always really obsessed with the booklets in CDs at the time, you know, for where you'd see the lyrics. 
And I, I would like love some song. And then I would look at the lyrics and the way that the line breaks would be, it would feel so moon June spoon all of a sudden. It was like, and without being able to hear the melody, suddenly these words that seem so profound would seem trite to me. And so on my first handful of records, I published the um, the lyrics. I wrote them like they were prose. And people, I got a surprising amount of attention for that. I think that was kind of like the beginning of people commenting on me being like a good songwriter or whatever. It was really just like a parlor trick, I think. It, <laughs> it really just hides how hacky rhymes can feel on a page. Yeah. You know, um, and, and it kind of like you, you, you get to take out your ain'ts and your double negatives and you sound a little bit more refined and stuff like that. Um, and around the time that I did, I am very far. That was, that was a time I was reading a lot of poetry and that was when I stopped doing that. And I started being more honest with myself and chopping the, um, the, Po the songs up more in a poetic conventional poetic format i could never prove this but i kind of feel like for some people they started to esteem the songs less once i started to um indent <laughs> once i started to break up the lines more in a conventional way or something because it didn't quite have the magic trick of putting it doing it like the prose yeah. um but yeah I, I guess i do think of them as as very much connected and and i think of um they they are and they aren't. I mean, well, there's a real there's an oral dimension to poetry, and you know, the, when you the older and further back you go, the more you hear it. And I guess maybe that's why I really connect with like Blake or Robert Burns or something like that. But and Dylan Thomas is very musical. Um, but but I also feel like for me, like rap was another thing that brought me back to that, which is like it's this odd connection of like. <laughs> making space in your language so that it's not too dense so that a melody works mm -hmm. and negotiating your breath and doing a little dance of the sounds that your mouth is making. And it's something about this weird little dance between like the sound of words and the meaning of words and the rhythm within the words um, and making it too dense, but not too dense. It's this really beautiful balance that, that I do feel like is, I very much do connect to, to poetry and, the, and kind of the oral literary tradition. No, it's funny. I was, um, I took our, our daughter, uh, is a, she's a freshman in college and she plays guitar. And I took her a couple of years ago to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And, um, and they had at that point, I forgot who the artists were, but, it, but the same year, Chicago was being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with, I think mm -hmm. it was either NWA or Public Enemy. And so on those in the, wow. um, yeah. And in the, uh, and, and in their, in the display cases, they have handwritten lyrics of those artists and, you know, Chicago seventies, you know, it was uh, just you and me. I think it was one of their kind of ballady 70s stuff and the, you know, simple lines on the page. And then you got to, yeah. like I said, whether it was public enemy or NW and, and, or NWA, and it's exactly what you were saying. And it was the lyrics on the page they were running out of room to fit. Like you could see they got to the end of the line and they were writing words up and down the page. Like they could not fit all of the wow. words on a line. And it was so cool because I could just imagine them going, Oh shit, I still still have five more words to say and there's no more space on this line. And so it just it the, the the difference between Chicago and whatever group that was was so different because in exactly what you were saying, it was they were thinking, I have to, I have more words to say, and yet there's no more space to write it. So it was crazy to see on the page. We went back there. That was the first time we went, and we just went back there a month ago, and they have a Billy Joel um lyric sheet from the song Big Shot. And there's a line in Big Shot where he goes, um, um, when you wake him in the morning with your head on fire and he, the original word instead of head was mouth. So he originally had, when you wake him in the morning with your mouth on fire. And, and I thought, I think that was the only word he changed in the song. And I'm, I just remember thinking, I'd love to have been there when he thought, yeah, what mouth doesn't work? Head is better. Like, what was it about head that sounded better than mouth? Um, but that was the original. Well, you know, you, 
and I didn't used to be this way, but I'm more and more and more obsessed with like one tiny word. And it, it has to do with like how it all flows off, off the, out of your mouth. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's just something about, um, I've used this metaphor before, but there, it, I feel a lot like sometimes like songwriting, especially lyric writing, is like being a safe cracker in the movies when you see them like putting their ear up and they're kind of doing these teeny tiny little turns. You're waiting to hear that click. Right. You know what I mean? There's a thing. You can feel it when it's like click. It's, and it's it could be the subtlest difference, but just even a difference between A and V or something. Yeah. Really takes it from like vinegar to wine, you know? Yeah. It's really and, a, not to mix my metaphors, but it's be, such a cool thing. And maybe it wasn't even the, maybe it was just the image of a mouth on fire doesn't sound as, as it makes me think he's got morning breath or something. Yeah. Right. Right. And head on fire. You can imagine like when you're hung over, your head feels like it's on fire, but your mouth on fire. Right. Maybe, maybe we're overthinking it. Maybe it's just the image of a mouth on fire. Isn't the same as a head on fire. So, um, but so you mentioned something earlier and it reminds me of a quote that Hemingway once said, Hemingway once said that all writers should go to art galleries to get inspired. Um, and I'm curious how you feel about that, maybe whether it's art galleries or just other types of art in general, besides writing, because we've, I think we've already covered books and things. But um, do, do you think, what are your thoughts on that sentiment that, that writers need to maybe explore visual art to get, ins to get inspired? Well, I mean, I think about all the time how I don't go to museums as much as I want to, because every time I go, and this is, I'm really obsessed with like music listening and I have this really complicated like playlist system that I do. And one of the, my playlists is a playlist that I make just for listening to in museums. And I've been working on it for years and years. So I think about it all the time when I put new songs in that playlist. Um, I have, I always dependably have an out of body experience when I go to a museum by myself. If I go with somebody else, it's not the same. But when I go by myself and I put my music on so that I can disconnect from the scene around me and I don't have to hear people talking and stuff, and I can, I'm very good at like daydreaming and going into my own head because um, I kind of grew up there. Um, but usually what happens is, the first five to 30 minutes of the museum are frustrating. Kind of like when you sit down to meditate where you're like, you're like, I got to see stuff. Where's the stuff? Right. Where do I want to go? What, what right. part of the museum do I want to go? Oh, look, it's Picasso. I got to see that. I got to see this. You know what I mean? And then you settle. You st Eventually you start to settle and you ideally you get lost. You stop thinking about what you want to see and have you seen that room yet? Mm -hmm. You start just kind of like letting your feet carry you where you're going to go. And what I find is that I'm always surprised by what I like. I have these ideas in my head about what my taste is in visual art. Um, and and I, so I'll, I always go to like um, the Northern European Renaissance. I really like like, you know, all of that stuff really connects with me. I think, but, but then I end up getting completely into like the last time I was there, I was like completely hung up on just the most basic shit, like Monet. I was like staring at Monet paintings that have, I've seen in calendar art a million times. Right. But like at that moment, it was, I was like seeing it for the first time. Um, but what I find at a museum is it's not so much that I'm going to see a piece of art that inspires a song. Never, really, I don't think. But it, it brings you in touch with like the numinous, you know, in the same way that going into nature does. Mm -hmm. Your brain just, you get this kind of like weightlessness of spirit where your, your mind is like floating freely about and you feel the humanity of the artist and you feel the universality of like people just leaving their mark. Each painting is sort of like somebody not in not 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 like um cerebrally trying to communicate something but like accidentally sidelong swiping past meaning just communi communicating this thing that you couldn't say and that's why you had to paint it 
and who knows even what it is. And you might see something different in it the next day than you did the day before. But I just feel this sort of weird universality of humans just doing the same things over and over again and feeling the same things over and over again. And this sort of the spirit that underlies it all. And I, I often find that at those moments, I immediately, I suddenly want to put on my favorite song, or I might want to listen to something I'm working on at the moment and, and be like, does this song uh, partake of this feeling? Like, like I suddenly feel like I understand what, um, what uh, I want art to do. I, I, I get that hair on your end feeling going through my whole body and I understand it really strongly. And then I'm like, time to listen to this song that's a demo I just wrote the other day and like feel like, does it touch this? You know, and like at those moments, it's very clear like where it doesn't. You know, it's very clear wh where it does and it's very clear where it doesn't. And usually that's like a great time for me sometimes to revise. Um, uh. But but also sometimes I might catch a feeling in a museum that just informs my soul for like years after that. And, and then I'll write like, I'll notice that like four different songs I wrote over a five year period had a little feeling of like this one painting I saw one time, hmm. you know, this one feeling that I got one time. I remember I was at this, um, I was at the Met, I think. And I don't even remember what the painting was, but it was of a child and they were really strongly lit. And in the background, there was this sort of twilight landscape that seemed to be stretching off infinitely. And it almost seemed like they were right in front of a black hole that was going to suck them into it. And there was this really strong sense of like innocence about to get, you know, vacuumed into a void. And it was disturbing. It was really disturbing to me. Um, and I think that I wrote like five or six songs that had a little feeling of that painting in them, you know, not intentionally, but it wound up in there. So let me ask you about the ritual then, because I, you know, I'm big on, I read all these interviews with writers in the Paris review and they talk about ritual. And one of the things that I find that, that I notice the differences between songwriters and other types of writers is songwriter is if you read, ever read those articles with, with, you know, poets and novelists and things like that. They, all of them will say, you got to write every day, get your butt in the seat, whether it's for a certain number of day, uh, of hours or minutes or words or pages, you got to do it. It doesn't matter how bad it is, but it's funny how so few songwriters tell me that they do that. It's much more of the, you know, don't force it. Don't wait for the inspiration, you know, uh, you know, d just if it's not coming, it's not coming, but it's, I find that interesting that, that, you know, other types of, of genres are very insistent on writing every day, but so few songwriters tell me, oh, yeah, it's important to sit down every day, even if you don't have ideas, just do something. So what do you think about that? Is that important? Is that the habitual creation as a songwriter, is that important every day to do? Uh, I have like two different possible responses to that. And one of them is cheeky. So I'll say that one first because it's maybe funnier. I have this theory that if you're a creative person, you are sort of like um, drawn to the arts, but then like what art discipline you do has a lot to do with your personality. Hmm. So I've, I feel like people who like to like sit around and like ruminate and, and shut themselves in, they like to be like writers or painters and people who are like bossy and megalomaniacal might want to be like a film director and I have um, my theory is that musicians just don't like to, they just don't want to grow up and they don't want to work too hard. <laughs> <laughs> so like and they don't want to have to be on time and they don't want to have to say, I'm sorry, that was my fault. <laughs> and things like, maybe maybe right. I'm getting a little personal. Um, no, I mean, I don't know. I, I I think that's never how songwriting worked for me. Songwriting for me, um, when I was younger, it poured out of me a lot. Um, and it would just stop me in my tracks and I would just write a song in like five minutes. You know what I mean? Um, 
And now that I'm older, I don't know if it's a mix of something about the makeup of my brain now, but I know that part of it has to do with just having more responsibilities in my life. Like it's a lot harder to just be like, Hey, shut up. Stop. I got to write a song. Go away. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, or like, Hey, I know I got to pay this bill or else you're going to turn off the electricity, but I got to write this song. I mean, I would have done that when I was 22, but like, I can't do it anymore now that I'm 46. Um, so I find that for me, it's a little bit more like making a date with songwriting. I go, I'm going to, you know, and I even will go away to places and be like, I'm going to go write for like a week or two here. And then I'm going to schedule another thing to write for a week or two here. Um, and I think that's why I like co-writing is because like you have to commit to doing it. Um, but I do try to do something creative every single day because I feel like you're going to curl up and dry up and die, you know, if you don't as a, mm -hmm. as a, as a, creative person as an artist like you're supposed to do it every day it'd be like if you're a pro athlete and you're not exercising every day like you're not gonna hold your job very long you know what i mean right and if you when you look at like musician musicians the people who are better than us at playing instruments they practice all the time you know what i mean they don't they don't practice when they feel like it right um so the way i think of writing is you know, you do, sometimes you force yourself because something might come out of it. You know, I've definitely sat down and, and written something like written for like four hours, a song that like the whole time I was like, this is, this is bad. This is really, really not very good. And then at the end, I'm like, come back to it. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, the bridge is good. And then I take the bridge and the bridge is the first the next day I start again. And the bridge is the verse and I throw hmm. everything out, out away that I did the next day. Um, or conversely, you know, you sit around and you you remember that bridge in four years when you're working on another song where you're like, I need a fucking bridge for this thing. And then you're like, Oh yeah. remember that bridge. That was the only good thing I did that one day that I worked and banged my head against the wall. So I do like showing up. I do like showing up to work. Um, and I don't think, I do think there's such a thing as forcing it, but I don't think that there's necessarily any harm in like hitting the gym, so to speak. And like yeah. we're trying to get some work done, even if you know, you're not at your best, you know what I mean? Right, right, right. So on a practical, just on a purely practical level, because I'm fascinated by this with songwriters, when we do these, I do these interviews and they show me their phones and their phones are just, they show me all the voice memos that they've made. And there's hundreds of voice <laughs> memos, but there's no organization, no labeling, no anything like that. And I go, how do you go back? You know, what if you say to yourself, oh, what about that bridge six months ago? And you've got to scroll through. So I guess two part question. Do you have voice memos? I'm sure you do of creative things on your phone. And do you organize them at all in any form? Well, my I'm very lucky in this respect because my father is a very, very type A anal driven <laughs> organizational man. And I inherited that from him. I, I, not necessarily the way that, I mean, I'm sorry, dad, if you're listening to this, it spills over into every aspect of his life. And it's sometimes a way that's a little stifling, but I, and I don't, I don't think I uh, inherited that, but I definitely inherited, you know, like my idea of a relaxing time, you know, some people like to, um, you know, knit or crochet or like watch sports or like pick at their nails or something you know what i like to do is like organize things you know go into the media room and like alf like organize all my make sure my lps are in order or like you know divide like go through old photographs and like try to figure out what which one came before the you know, the other one, you <laughs> put them in chronological mm -hmm. order, crazy. weird. I think that in another, I think if I started my life over again and were, was like, I'm not going to do any art at all. I could have like really been a very happy, like librarian or archivist. <laughs> There's I'm very like soothed by putting things into order and color coding them and stuff like that. Um, so I'm pretty good with that. I, uh, I do write every day, but sometimes it's just a little, and I do organize it and I 
But with my voice memos, I just put them all in the same folder. I don't obsessively organize them because I feel like um, there's the more that you fuss over a, a loose end, the more you're likely to ruin it. So like mm. when you have some idea, sometimes I'll get an idea for like a, a vocal melody and a guitar line and I'll know it's so good that I know it'll keep for even years maybe. So I'll just like remember where I put it but I, I won't come back and revisit it until I have the time to really chase it down because it's so potent that I know it's going to be good. I, yeah. I know like in my bones, like this little thing. And it's not like, uh, maybe that sounds like I'm saying like, like it's high quality. It's so high quality that it's, it's not that. What it is is that it's so it's so wrapped around something fundamental in my soul that I'll, it's like a little string. And it's like, I know when I pull that string, something's going to come out. <laughs> you know hmm. what I mean? So yeah. it's like, all of, but I don't have time right now to, to give it the, 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 the careful pull that it really needs. So I'm going to wait until everything's quiet. And then I'm going to, when I, when I do come back to that string and I pull it, I know something's going to come out. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I do organize them. I do organize everything, but I try not to, I try to be a little sacred about my ideas because I know that the more that you, if I, if I go back to that little idea and I listen to it going and don't, don't write it, but I go, oh, I know this is going to be a badass man. You know, like, right. I'm going to, every time I do that, I'm like, I'm like messing it up. I'm like yanking right. on the string just a little and like everything's getting all mixed up and it's not going to work. So I got to like, yeah. keep it sacred. So I'm going to throw another quote out at you. So Agatha Christie once said, the best time to plan a book is when you're doing the dishes. And I bring that up because so many songwriters tell me how many, tell me how many ideas they get for songs doing mundane activities, whether it's vacuuming or gardening or showering or walking. In other words, the best ideas come when we're not thinking about them. Um, and, and the create, and you know, I think part of that's to do with the fact that people have not been outside as much in the past couple of years, but how many song ideas people get when they're doing things that require kind of unconscious repetition. Um, so how often has that happened for you when you get song ideas during those mundane activities? Um, well, washing the, I hate washing the dishes and folding <laughs> laundry and all that stuff. So I can't be present with those tasks. I just want to get them over with. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, Damien Gerardo gets a lot of his ideas that way. I had a talk with him. He, that's how exclusively how he writes. He writes all his songs, like taking, he writes his songs at the dump. He he like takes it recycling to the dump and he writes his songs there. Whoa. But uh, I don't do that. I'm not like that. But I do um I I feel like creativity is this voice that's like periodically whispering to you kind of a little bit all the time. And sometimes it's going, hey, hey, idea over here. And sometimes it's more like yeah. really, really, really quiet. And so it's really important to train your ears to like hear it whispering. And if you hear it whispering, like you gotta stop. And at the very least, you've gotta like record the idea um, as in the most like helpful way for your future self that you can. Um, you, in much the same way as walking through museum, I always think about like that Walt Whitman thing where he's like talks about, he uses the word loaf all the time. He's always, always talks about like loafing. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's really important to loaf, you know, it's really important to like be in these, these, and in, and in meditation, they talk about like a calm, playful, open state of mind. And I think that that's what people get maybe when they're washing the dishes or folding laundry. I get it when I'm walking the dog. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's it's a walk, but like there's we're, there's no like destination, and I'm sharing space with this being, but he's not really requiring too much of me. And 
those are the moments. In fact, right when I came to California, there was this one song that I wrote where I was like, I'm not going to write any of this down. I'm just going to write it in my head on dog walks as I get to know the neighborhood. Um, and I still, I get a lot of ideas as I'm just walking and looking at palm trees and looking at the sunset and like, you know, noticing a, a nice house that I didn't see before. Um, things just kind of like pass through my brain. There's always like, monkey chatter in your brain that's like i should have done this i should have done that you know like you're no good you, you're someone's gonna get mad at you because you didn't pay this bill but like um th this is there's all underneath that there's that playful friendly voice that's just like whispering ideas to you i'm always trying to uh be sensitive to that voice you know as best i can you should read – there's a book that I read a few years ago called The Friendship by a guy named Adam Sisman, S-I-S-M-A-N, and it's about the friendship between Coleridge and Wordsworth. Um, and and a lot of that is exactly what you're talking about. But they talk – and there's a section of the book where he talks about how they created their poems. And they estimate Wordsworth walked over 100,000 miles in his lifetime, which even if you – it's some – it's I figured it out. It's like 30 miles a day for 30 years. It's something crazy or something like that. Anyway, um, or I forgot what it is. It's a lot. 100,000 miles is a lot. But he – what what uh, Sisman says is that both Wordsworth and Coleridge crafted almost all of their poems on walks. And I forgot which one. One of them wanted a rocky terrain. One of them liked a rocky terrain. The other one liked a flat terrain. But Wordsworth would – it's kind of exactly what you were saying. Wordsworth would compose – and revise almost all of his poems on walks in his head and wouldn't come back until they were finished. Yeah, that's, I, I admire that. Um, there's this, are you familiar with a songwriter named Chris Wiseman? No. He's amazing. He's really great. You should look into him. He's a really excellent writer. He's um, not as well known as he could be because he doesn't tour and he doesn't put his stuff on streaming. It's all on, it's all on Bandcamp. It's not on the DSPs. Um, but he has a thing where he likes to write, he wants to write the whole song in one sitting. And I love that. It's a way of letting go because, and it's also a way of like daring yourself into some bravura performance. And a lot of his songs are kind of bravura performances. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you it's the high wire act and you got to like deliver the results. I like those challenges, but it doesn't quite work that way for me when it comes to like Will Chef material, because I do end up getting the, um, the Eureka moment where I suddenly realize that something is um, suddenly realize that there's some last twist you know what i mean like yeah it just comes to me when you talk about those walking through a museum like those are the moments where i'm like oh my god i just got it i just got the the final touch the final twist the thing that saves it all comes to me when i least expect it and not when i most expect it <laughs> you know right. so if i were to set some arbitrary rule like i have to finish on a walk that's a great starting place and it's even a nice thing to tell yourself but like if you are really pure like really really intensely unforgiving about that rule it's ultimately i don't think it's very helpful like you, you kind of lie to yourself that that you're going to finish it all on the walk but then if you have another idea on another walk two weeks later that like makes it all sing you shouldn't like leave it out because of the principle of the thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, if it, for Coleridge and, and um, it's like, whatever, like that could, that could work fine for them. And, and I love that Chris Wiseman does it like that. Um, I just think, you know, the truth of the matter is, is like, I think that it's really all about um, having a technique. Like, right. you know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, all, all roads lead to Rome. So it's like, if you have a technique, like you could have a technique that's completely different than me. Like you could say, okay, um, instead of writing it all on one walk, I'm going to write one line a day for a year. And it's like, that would work too. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's really just about 
believing in the technique. I, I mean, I can... yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent. And, and, but you know, when I have these conversations with songwriters and I'll say, do you have a ritual? And they'll say, no, not really. And then they'll spend 10 minutes telling me what the ritual is. And I'll say, do you see what you just told me? You have a ritual. Um, and, and, but I think you're right. For me, it's confidence, right? If having a ritual for me, at least ensures that there's a greater chance of success because this ritual has helped me before. And that confidence is often all you need, right? Well, I mean, ritual is such a well-chosen word because it has roots in religion. And I think that a lot of people think of like um, religion as like bogus, but then like by the same token, like we have this greater understanding now of like, how the placebo effect works, you know what I mean? And how like when you're talking about psychedelics, it's like set and setting and mindset and how those things work and how your teacher giving you the A made you an A writer. You know what I mean? It was like, you you didn't wake up um, a different person that morning. Right. You You were the same guy, but like once the A was bestowed, you changed. Yes. So there's this magical and it always cracks me up when people say, oh, it's no better than placebo, because it's like the reason that we compare things to placebo is that placebo is incredibly effective. You know, it just goes to show like how powerful your mindset and your commitment to a thing and your devotion to this practice, like like the magic that that unleashes in you. So to me, um, I do think that that stuff is is incredibly sacred. And just like religion, it shouldn't become dogma. So it's right. like, if you're just joylessly forcing yourself to write a song on a walk or a poem on a walk, <laughs> nobody really wants to hear that. You don't really even want to do it. You know? Yeah. So it's like, there, there has to be the seriousness of the, di- of the discipline combined with like the joy and the light playfulness and the openness um, those two things, it's like sort of our dual little dance, I think. There was, an, there was a study that came out last December in, uh, it was in, I'm reading this right here, Science Advances was the name of the journal. And they detail this stage of sleep called hypna, oh boy. Hy- hypnagogic or hypnagogic? Yes. Hy- how to say it again? Because I'm reading it. Hypnagogia. Is that right? Hypnagogic. Yeah. Hypnagogic. Like you're okay. falling asleep. Yes. So what they describe in the study was what Salvador Dali would do. And there's actually a picture of him I saw in Smithsonian Magazine. So what he does is he would hold an object like a spoon um, in his outstretched hand at sleep, in this chair, and he would drift off to, off to sleep. When he would drift off to sleep, obviously he'd let go of the spoon, the spoon would hit the floor, it would wake him up, and then he would start creating. And Thomas Edison did this as well, too. Mm. So, um, and it's the stage just before sleep. And apparently we only spend like 5% of our of our sleep in this moment. But, you know, it's not that moment when you're asleep. It's not the middle of the night. It's not when you're awake. But it's that few minutes before you drift off into a deeper sleep. And they call it, the researchers call it the, quote, ideal cocktail for creativity. And that's what Dolly would do. He would go paint, go create as soon as that, when when that spoon woke him up. Well, sleep and dreams are really, really important to me. And um, I have, have, in fact, written some of my favorite songs have either come directly out of dreams where I just dreamt the whole song or um, or I just woke up and I had a feeling, maybe it was the first verse, and I just wrote the entire rest of the song in like three minutes or something like that. Um, I and it, and it also happens a lot that I wake up and I'm like, ah, there's a great song in my dreams. And I, I know I can't remember it. I just, I, it's too, a little too far away for me to get. It. Um, so my first, my first thing, and I, I would definitely give this as advice to anyone is like, I think the first thing you should do when you open your eyes, um, you know, after you think about how grateful you are to be alive is you should write. You should do something creative immediately. That, that should be your first thing. Um, I write like, I, I might write like, um, you know, a whole poem, or I might like write seriously just one line. 
And I usually I write these big, long, run-on poems, and I don't even look at. I don't look at them. I don't think about whether they were good or not. I just like file them away, and then later on I go back and I I organize them and I keep them in, in as, as my like, you know, my storage of grain that will feed me through the winter. <laughs> you know, it's like I've got these this all of these lines, and some of them are stupid, and some of them are good, and some of them are funny, and some of them are sublime. Um, so I think that it's good to have that stuff, but I think it's just as important to just very gently ease your brain from um, that beautiful sort of sleeping state through that, that phase and bring it right into creativity. You know, like it's a great way to wake up. So right. yeah, it's, I mean, dreaming and sleep and, um, and all of that for whatever reason, you know, that kind of cocktail of like mysticism and, and all of that stuff that for whatever reason has been really creatively stimulating for me. That's always been a really, really big part of my process. Yeah, definitely. And that's it for the latest episode of songwriters on process. Don't forget. You can find all of my interviews with over 200 songwriters on my songwriters on process website at songwritersonprocess.com, going all the way back to 2010. You can read them, watch them, or listen to them. So until next time, thanks for listening.